In order to have a better grasp on how matter is classified, we first need to understand what atoms are and how they are arranged themselves. We've discussed that elements are kind of like the building blocks of matter, very similar to the way Legos, you can take Legos and build other things from them. Um, but an atom themselves are the smart, smallest particle of an element. Um, basically, an element is a type of atom, the way that Cheerios are a type of cereal. So to get an idea of how big an atom is, or really how small an atom is, is there are 2,000 billion billion atoms of oxygen in just one tiny drop of water. So just get a grasp of what that number is. It's 2 followed by 21 zeros. There are a few other analogies in our textbook, so sometime when you're in the classroom, if you want to turn to page 34 and read about some other ways to think about how small an atom is, that would be a good idea because it's so small we can't see it and we can't even use a microscope to see it. So sometimes it can be hard to picture something just that small. So atoms are actually made up of even smaller substances, but it's just really hard for us to separate the atom into those small substances. But protons and neutrons join together in the central part of the atom called the nucleus. Protons um, are positive, so a way to remember that is pro- that reword means positive, and neutrons carry no charge. A way to remember that is neutrons are neutral. If you are neutral to something, you don't really have an opinion about it. You don't sway one way or another. Electrons circle around the nucleus constantly, and they carry a negative charge. So as they're traveling around the nucleus, they actually travel at different distances from the nucleus, and those are called orbitals, or another way we call those is um, energy shells, and they're in these different distances based on how much energy they have. Now each orbital can only hold a certain amount of electrons, and the way you can think about that would be like um, a track around a football field. Each lane gets larger the further away it goes from the football field, so therefore it has more space to hold uh, more people on the lane or in terms of the orbital, they have more space to hold more electrons the further away they go from the nucleus. So this picture gives us a very, very simplified explanation of what an atom might look like based on where the different parts of the atom are located. Just to give us some perspective, protons and neutrons have just about the same mass, so they take up the same amount of matter. And electrons are way, 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 way smaller. And because they're smaller, they have a lot more ability to move faster. This picture gives a great demonstration of, of their relationship to each other. So if one electron weighed the same as a dime, if we could make um, an analogy here, a proton would be the same as a gallon of milk. So if you imagine holding a dime in one hand and a gallon of milk in another hand, you definitely see which one is more massive. Because protons and neutrons are so much more massive than electrons, when we talk about the atom's total mass, we're usually going to be focused on just what the masses of the protons and neutrons are when they're added up together. The electrons are so tiny, they don't really add on to the total mass um, and make a difference overall. But because they are, are separate from the protons and neutrons and circling the nucleus of the atom at different distances from the atom, they actually are responsible for determining how much space the atom takes up. So the more electrons there are, the further away they'll be from the nucleus and the atom will be a little bit bigger. If there are fewer electrons, they're not going to be as spread out from the nucleus, so it will be a smaller atom. So just to remind you about the definition of an element, it's a substance that we can't break down into other substances, um, by physical means, so that means like chopping it in half, or chemical means, so putting it through a chemical reaction. So um, another way to think about it is that an element is a type of atom, so a hydrogen element is a certain type of atom, and it's going to be different from a helium atom because it has a different arrangement of those protons and neutrons. And elements are found on the periodic table, 
And in a few weeks, we're going to learn a lot more about how to read the periodic table and get a lot of the same information that we're talking about right now from the numbers that are written in each box. So just as we talked about properties of matter before and how scientists typically will describe matter using certain characteristics, they do the same thing with elements to compare elements to each other to try to see how many of them have similar characteristics and how many of them are different from each other and that helps them to arrange the elements in a certain way on the periodic table. So there are many different ways to describe them but the most common ways are going to be listed here in our notes and a lot of them are very obvious like the structure is another way to talk about the shape. We've discussed hardness and color before those are pretty obvious there. Um, if you've heard the word luster before you may have heard about it in like a shampoo commercial um, talking about having lustrous hair refers to making your hair more shiny. So when we talk about luster in terms of an element, we'll talk about um, if the element's surface looks shiny or not. Density kind of is a description of the heaviness based on the mass and volume relationship. Melting point is when it melts, so basically when it's going to go from a solid to a liquid. And boiling point would be when the, the element would go from a liquid form to the gas state. Here are some new concepts for us. Conductivity is the description of an element's ability to let electricity or heat flow through it. So another way to say that would be um, its ability to conduct electricity or heat. The word ductility is a description of the element's ability for us to draw it into a wire. So for it to kind of be pulled out um, and for it to hold its shape as it's being stretched out into the wire form. Malleability is the ability for it to be pounded into a shape and one thing I like to do to help us remember that is to look at the first five letters of the word malleability and it reminds me of the word mallet and if you think about what you do with a mallet you can pound um, an object into a sheet and so that can help you maybe remember what this definition is. And finally, solubility we've talked about before. It's the ability to just break apart into smaller pieces in the water. Now we've talked about this word before in class, or I've kind of used it in class, but haven't really described what the actual definition is. But a molecule is when we take two or more atoms and we bond them together. It could be of the same element where um, we might have two oxygen atoms that have bonded together because they don't like to be alone. And so if I have a structure of these two atoms combined together, we would just call that a molecule to show that there's more than one. It could be of different elements. So water, for instance, has two hydrogens and one oxygen combined together. So I'd refer to that structure as a water molecule. And we've talked about compounds before, but just to add on to its definition, a compound is specifically a molecule that has two different elements, or more than two different elements, that are chemically combined. So table salt is an example. We've used that example many times in class. We have sodium attached to a chlorine, and we have this metal combined with a gas, and it creates a white um, crystal. So that's an evidence that we've gone through a chemical reaction and that we've got a completely new substance. So this would be considered a compound. Now we can even break down compounds further into two different classes. One type of compound is called organic and this would be any compound that has the element carbon somewhere in its formula. So a few characteristics of, car of organic compounds would be that um, typically they come from things that were living at one time. They will typically have low melting and boiling points, so it doesn't take a lot of energy for us to get them to change state. They're often found at liquids or gases at room temperature, and they really don't conduct electricity or heat well. Uh, they're better insulators than conductors. Anything that does not contain the element carbon is going to be considered an inorganic compound. So in the prefix just means not. For some practice let's take a look at a few of these formulas just to see which would be considered organic and which would be considered inorganic. So this first one is CO2 
Another word for that is carbon dioxide. And all you have to do is look for if there is a capital C with no lowercase after it because capital C is carbon's symbol. So since this is called carbon dioxide, this is going to be considered organic. And sorry for my sloppy handwriting. The next one is sodium chloride. It's table salt. So this time I've got a CL. And because there's a lowercase l after the C, that means it's a different element. It's chlorine instead of carbon. So this would be considered inorganic. Hopefully your handwriting is better than mine. The next one I have water, which is H2O. This one you don't see any C's at all that could possibly be confusing to you as to whether it's considered carbon or not. So because there's no carbon, again, this is considered inorganic. And finally, this last one is glucose, and this is the sugar found in photosynthesis. I do see letter C. There's no lowercase after it, so I know that this is carbon. So that tells me that this is organic. So hopefully we understand a little bit more about how atoms and um, their attachments to each other are going to affect their structure and what we call them. We want to make sure that we are confident in using these words as we describe matter because as we go into discussion of uh, periodic table in the future, we'll be using these words a lot. So we want to make sure that we understand them. And if we don't, please speak up and let me know that we need to have a little bit more practice and a little bit more explanation.